I'm happy to give you a short overview of what will uh, happen uh, in uh, next approximately 16 minutes of our digital event. First, I will make a short introduction to the core feature of EU Tech. Then I will introduce our panelists today. And um, uh, one of our panelists, Evelyn Negatia, will uh, pro provide keynote speech. And uh, we will deep dive into the questions before we answer all the questions from the audience. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to um, uh, make a very short introduction of the EU tech. One second, please. So we started um, six years ago as a, as a European Technology Chamber, and uh, now we are basically um, uh, progressing to, to uh, um, uh, many members and many companies with us. So uh, do you see my presentation by chance? Mm -hmm. okay. First page. Okay, uh, here we go. Okay, so uh, we have uh, we have uh, alliances, regional alliances, and technology alliances, as well as impact alliance. Today we are having webinar with the Digital Transformation Alliance. Uh, the chamber is very active, and as you can see, we have a plus two hundred webinars a year with over uh, close to seven hundred speakers. Uh, in, in the future, we will do many expos. Every section will do hybrid events and virtual exhibitions together. So it will be very interesting for all of you to get engaged with us. Uh, we have uh, over 50,000 registered, uh, uh, which, is, which means we have a lot of people that they are uh, connected somehow with the European Technology Chamber. 90% uh, of these people are basically company owners and decision makers. Um, also, we uh, um, we are number one tech network currently, and access we have access to the speakers and panelists uh, with um, exclusive market insights, business opportunities where we have a networking meetings to exchange ideas and operations and the projects, and we also have uh, EU projects and foundings where we uh, including our members to to uh, basically engage with the European. Uh, uh, EU tenders. Uh, we have uh, many insights like white papers, position papers. We are very proud on our vision for Europe magazine. And then also we have lots of programs like social media, digital transformation. We do awards, cl uh, climate action partnerships, and etc. Uh, also, we have a tech forum, which we are really proud of, where we actually um, uh, uh, gathering together on different virtual events, uh, virtual expos, and then also we uh, create and manage our own own events. So, if you want to engage with us, please uh, send me send me your short message in the public chat or uh, email to me. We also have director for partnership and institutional cooperation, uh, Mr. Marcus Wimmen, and we also have Federico Gonzalez de Aledo, who is uh, actually director for memberships for for European Technology Chamber. Uh, I try to be uh, as as um, um, fastest as possible, so we have more space for for our um, respective um, 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 uh, panelists today. So now I would like to uh, introduce uh, um, our our panelists today um, very quickly. So um, Evelyn Nagatia is uh, throughout. Th Top leader, uh, corporate trainer, speakers, and strategies advisor, and fourth industrial revolution. She's a founder and CEO of Techavot LTD for IR uh, Academy. Uh, Evelyn serves two board members, one with the EU Tech as a, a board member in uh, Women in Tech, and also board member and president elect in Rotary Club on Nongo Road. Uh, she's author of a book, book titled Understanding the Fourth Industrial Revolution and several for industrial revolution articles. 
As a Ford Industrial Revolution leader, media channels have interviewed her and spoken to her at various conferences and events. Evelyn also received global recognitions and awards such as a Inspiring 50 United Kingdom Award winner, Who is Who in Industry 4.0, top, uh, top 50 Global Thought Leaders in Emerging Technology, Top 50 Global Thought Leaders in Ad Tech, and so on. Before founding Tech Award, uh, Evelyn worked in the corporate world and various sectors in the economy, such as oil and gas, corporate banking, power, infrastructure, manufacturing, and real estate. Um, our second panelist today, it's a great pleasure and honor to have you uh, with us. Dr. Beatrice Bischoff is a PR and marketing professional consultant. She attended the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Her areas of study was political science, cons uh, constitutional law, and literature science. Uh, she graduated as a, uh, in a PhD uh, with economic and social history as an additional subject. Until 1996, she was a member of managing board of the company of her family. Afterwards, she completed her education as a TV journalist in a Kirsch Media Group. Since that time, she worked as a TV journalist, political science, and author. She's a member of managing board of Foreign Affairs Association, Munich, um, German representative of Mohammed bin Rashid Aerospace Hub in Dubai, member of board of trustee of Kavala International University in Minnesota, USA, EU Tech, European Technology Chamber, board member of Women in Tech, columnist in the European uh, Wimmer Media Group. Her special project is PETS, a um, foreign uh, policy uh, ecosystem approach. Uh, it creates and mm -hmm. gives answers to the burning questions about future of the work and future of the education, which is our topic today. Uh, and the third, and uh, uh, not, not least, uh, Mikhail... Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Ma has been lecturing uh, universities and business schools in the last 30 years in Spain, Europe, and China, and held C level position in several industry applying uh, digital transformation projects. He's also an entrepreneur in uh, ed. Evelyn, if you can share your screen, please. And uh, 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 thank you so much for preparing this keynote speech for us. Okay, one second. No problem. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. And when I scroll, you can see? Yeah. Good, okay. Thank you so much, Ned, for the, for the introduction. Um, like he said, my name is Evelyn Gatia. Um, I represent Tekawat, uh, which is a company that uh, the business model is really centered around the fourth industrial revolution. So everything that we do is really centered around that. Uh, corporate training, thought leadership, research and speaking engagements. And we focus on the strategic element of the fourth industrial revolution and its emerging technologies. So we don't focus on the technical aspect. We focus on the more strategic elements, such as you know, um, people helping people understand uh, the bigger picture. So you know, what's the big picture of the emerging technologies? How are they being used across industries, um, et cetera? So we are also an advocate of the UTEC Chamber, um, and like Ned mentioned, I'm also a board member of the Women in Tech Alliance. Um, I won't go into, into our vision, mission, and values. Um, so just to cut us off, you know, um, one of the interesting reports that we've seen uh, is uh, by World Economic Forum, uh, which is called Catalyzing Education 4.0. And they said this, that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, millions of children and young people were out of school globally. And among those in school, many were not learning the skills needed to succeed economically in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. The pandemic has further exacerbated these trends 
with nearly 1.6 billion children and young people impacted by school closures over the past two years and minimal access to remedies such as remote learning amongst those already most marginalized. So already there was, um, there was an issue, but you know, COVID came and actually um, exacerbated um, the trend. So it's very important for us to see how to, um, what's really the importance of digital transformation in the area of education, because for us to transform or um, transition fully into the fourth industrial revolution, we must educate um, our children, we must educate ourselves uh, in that sense. So what really is digital transformation in education? So a few definitions, and I know there are many definitions out there, um, but in a nutshell, you know, when we talk about uh, digital transformation in education, we're talking about the use of emerging technologies to improve the experience of learners, educators, and caregivers. So it's not just about learners, but also educators. How are they using the emerging technologies? How are they learning, you know, upskilling themselves? And also caregivers are more involved in, in the process of um, their children learning. So how do we also incorporate them uh, in this through collaboration tools and et cetera. Um, related to digital transformation in education uh, are, are two key terms that we'll be looking at. Education 4.0. And that's really about um, making use of the emerging technologies to align the education system with the fourth industrial revolution and the 21st century skills. So it's really, we're saying the world is going, you know, to, and, and I know there's a fifth industrial revolution already that is being uh, talked about. But when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, um, it's making, aligning the education system. So education 4.0 is aligning the education system to where the world is going in terms of the fourth industrial revolution. But it's not just about technology, it's also about other skills that are related um, that will help us transition uh, or make use of those emerging technologies. EdTech is also another related concept. Um, and we know that EdTech is actually at the forefront of digital transformation in education. So when you think about the EdTech platforms, when you think about EdTech uh, technologies and stuff like that, they are really championing uh, the digital transformation, although digital transformation includes a lot more than just um, the emerging technologies. And the emerging technologies that we're talking about, are, you know, uh, and we've come across all this big data, analytics, artificial intelligence, extended reality, which includes virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. We have advanced robotics, 3D printing, and many other technologies that are helping us um, because the fourth industrial revolution is about bringing uh, the coming together of the physical and the digital worlds. So these are technologies that are helping us uh, merge, if you like, or the coming together of the physical and the digital worlds. So just some statistics um, to help us sort of just get a grasp on what um, um, EdTech, which is at the forefront of, of digital transformation in education. And on my left is the global, so I like to look at venture capital funding because it, it helps us understand what's the activity around uh, the different subsectors when it comes to technology. So where venture capitalists are investing uh, or where there's more activity, it shows us you know, uh, the maturity of the subsector and, and you know, um, where they're putting their money to, which tells of um, you know, the risks that they see, et cetera. So on my left is the global, uh, VC funding per tech, uh, tech subsector. And on my right is Africa, the global versus Africa. Now, when you look at the global picture, and this is, a, this is sourced from Tech Nation, um, you will see, and I've highlighted there with, uh, in red, um, with an arrow showing where education is. So there are different subsectors that they are, that they are being, uh, uh, that you know, venture capitalists are investing in. We're seeing health and, um, this particular one was up until 2020, but it gives us a good picture of, of, of um, cause 2020 is when we, we had the, the onset of the pandemic. So we see health taking the lead, uh, health tech, transportation, FinTech is also at the top and education is you know third from the bottom. So there's really a lot more that we can do in the education sector in terms of digital transformation or ed tech. Excuse me, we don't see the slide you are mentioning. If you could please. Oh. Yes, yes. Um, I would just. Moving? We don't uh, see it. We, we don't see it at all. 
Okay, let me do, let me just um, one second. I think we stopped on uh, what is on the left and what is on the right side. Okay, let me try and share that again. Can you see Ed Tech Statistics? Yeah. 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 And if I scroll down to the next. Yes. You can see me scrolling? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the slide I was talking about. So on the on the uh, yeah, on the left is a global picture, venture capital funding. On the right we have um the Africa picture. Okay. So I talk Sorry? Are you okay? Yeah, that's all right. Okay. So I talked about the global picture where we see there's a lot more activity in the health tech, fintech, et cetera, and education is cut from the bottom. And when you look at the Africa picture, um, this is uh, up until 2021, uh, we find fintech, there's so much activity around fintech, which is about 62% um, of the funding went to fintech and only 6% to edtech. Um, so we can see such a huge difference. Um, and some of the concerns around why the investment in ed tech or education uh, technology is quite low. You know, um, there's an issue of competition. I think because we saw the pandemic come and everyone was rushing uh, to provide, you know, e-learning solutions, learning management systems. So there was a lot of activity around that and a lot of startups that came to provide or to fill that gap. Um, there's also concerns around the profitability of the sector. There's also concerns around um, the exit strategy because venture capitalists are always uh, looking at how to, uh, what's the exit strategy for them. So that's a snapshot of where we are in terms of edtech. And when we look at the top trends in education 4.0, what are the top trends that we are seeing? So e-learning, I think, was a good entry point for us, even during the pandemic, where, you know, um, log in and, you know, do your learning courses, on-demand platforms, learning management systems, um, et cetera, um, and utilizing different uh, technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, like platforms, artificial intelligence, and data. But then we also see adaptive learning, which is really about uh, more personalized learning. So... Where um, students have a different uh, different abilities or different uh, pace of learning, um, you know the system can adapt to that and be able to use the data uh, that is provided to sort of adapt to their learning options, their learning preferences, their learning pace to make the learning experience or the learning outcome much more uh, favorable and personalized to every uh, student. We're also seeing gamification, so. You know, kids when they're in school um, like to play games. So, you know, if you can actually incorporate that into our learning systems, um, there's a lot more learning retention that we'll experience, and we're seeing a lot more of that. Whether we are saying, you know, uh, using cloud platforms or using um, virtual reality, the concept of using games can they compete? Um, uh, students competing against each other, just playing games and seeing what the outcome is. There's a lot more. Um, probability of them retaining the information. We also have immersive learning where say, for example, um, you know, this, this makes use of um, extended reality and that includes virtual reality, like I mentioned, augmented reality and mixed reality. And this is really like, you know, say for example, you know, kids need to go on a field trip and, uh, you know, may not need to travel to the exact location of the field trip. They can uh, use, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality to actually experience the field trip from a kind of a virtual setup. We also have collaborative tools where we're saying um, in a situation where you have a mixture of students, for example, some are remotely learning, others are actually physically there. How do they collaborate in terms of doing group work, yeah. in terms of, um, uh, just being able to learn um, as a group. So it's more not necessarily individualized learning, but um, how can you also utilize peer-to-peer uh, -peer sort of education, if you, if you like, where other students are also, um, um, you know, from a group perspective, you ed sort of educate each other or, or, or coach each other, and then the teacher comes in to just be sort of like a guide. Um, we also see smart classrooms, and this is re really where um, uh, uh, we would 
be wanting to end up. Um, you know, where students again are using some, whether you're remotely connected, you can still access the classroom and they're able to collaborate um, in that sense and use uh, different mechanisms, um, virtual reality again, um, and the whole concept. So smart classrooms incorporate all these tools in terms of e-learning, adaptive learning, gamification, etc., to give us like a full picture of where we intend to be. Evelyn, we have lost again your presentation. Oh my, okay. Yeah. And we are about to uh, extend the 10 minutes time. Please wrap up, thank you. Okay, okay. I just have one more slide to go. Can you see the slide? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So this is the last slide. So why then is digital transformation important? We're seeing uh, it's about aligning to the future of work. So if the future of work and the fourth industrial revolution is going in this direction, in, in robotics, artificial intelligence, we must also then educate our children in a way that helps them adapt to the future of work. I mentioned personalized learning. I mentioned about uh, learning options is a wider variety, uh, depending on what your preference is, uh, what the preference of the child is in terms of la learning options. Learning in, uh, retention is improved. And then administrative tasks also, um, there's automation of uh, administrative tasks, enhanced progress monitoring and enhanced creativity. And, and this essentially, because we're using digital tools, um, digital tools to actually do the more repetitive tasks, then we are leaving uh, the students, the educators to actually do a lot more creative work. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'll leave it there as we now uh, go into a deep dive. So I was just to set the scene and um, then we can go and deep dive into, into questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, for one wonderful keynote speech. Now I'm very excited to deep dive into the points uh, at our panel discussion. Uh, Dr. Batris, um, the questions about future of the work in the insight of digital transformation are in the center of discussion during these days. Do you think we have to take into account the future of education? Do we need uh, a new kind of education? Yes, according to the predictions um, of all the professors, for most of all the professors in, in, in uh, Oxford and UK, uh, there will be a loss of employment due to the digital transformation in the economy. So therefore, the jobs that are concerned are in the middle sector, they think or it is ex expected. Um, uh, employees of big companies, uh, companies will not employ um, much more employ uh, employees anymore, e even less. So therefore we have to create a new a new possibility. Uh, economy has to be diversified more and the solution is to create entrepreneurs. And um, therefore digital education is necessary to create exactly this entrepreneurs for a new uh, for a new possibility um, for the working um, situation. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Welcome back. Uh, uh, first question for you is the adaptation of uh, education organization to the new situation sufficient enough? Well, that's a very broad question, and I guess that the answers are very different if we're talking about Africa, emerging countries, or 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 very developed countries. So I will I will give my view on what is happening in developed countries, especially in the area of Spain and Europe. And I think that there are uh, there is a difference between three types of educational organizations. One are schools others are universities and others are business schools. Um, generally speaking in Europe, the education, or, uh, the education bodies are very much regulated. Okay, so that means that you cannot do almost every, anything unless uh, the rules in the government about education change, which already tells us that we cannot rely much upon that because politicians are very, very conservative and um, their decisions are not always catered to the well-being of the people. They have more other uh, political aspects to consider. So that's bad news. That, that, that makes change really um, 
low, very slow. So in that sense, uh, for example, in Spain, more than 55% of uh, schools are public schools. So forget about any relevant change in the short term in that area, because uh, that's uh, happening only from the technological point of view. So that means that uh, there are changes in devices, there are changes in classrooms, there are changes in video conferencing, but that's just, as you know, a very limited scope of change. Let's go now to universities. Again, uh, there are uh, there is a huge part of universities which are public. They have exactly the same problem. So what they've done is just technological change. And you've got private universities who have gone a bit farther and are asking themselves, it's not only a technological issue, it is how we change the mindset of the students and the professors in order to adapt to the new situation. Here we can say that they are a bit more advanced, but not much more either. So yes, uh, we have got a lot of implementation of technological gadgets, but the professors, especially in the public universities, they have no incentive to change. So they continue with their with how they are teaching, just they are teaching with different technologies. So that means that change is not really happening a lot. Then you've got the private universities and the business schools, which all of them are private, and they are they are struggling to, to do it a bit better. And uh, again, uh, remember that uh, educational sector is one of the most conservative sectors that exists. And uh, they are struggling not to uh, lose their economic business model. So yes, they are doing technological changes, they are doing pedagogical changes, and they are try starting to train the professors in how to uh, transmit value in a completely different way than what they have been doing up to now. Some are doing quite well, but I would say that the majority is still lagging. So in that sense, I think that the response of the educational sector in developed countries is, is not very good at this, at this moment. And, um, and they need to change quite faster. I would say that we are entering into a process of change of the educational sector but uh, if you compare it with what private companies are doing in other sectors which are not education, uh, definitely it's lagging behind the needs of the society and the pupils. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Evelyn, you mentioned some challenges uh, in your presentation, but uh, it's never never enough to, to rephrase that. What are the, the, the most challenges we are facing in of education 4.0? Yeah, um, I think uh, Michael has actually mentioned a few. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, changing the mindset as well of the teachers, the educators uh, in that sense. But I want to focus on, you know, like um, infrastructure. So when you think about um, rural areas, you know, whether it's rural Africa, rural Europe, uh, whatever the case may be, um, connectivity is sometimes a challenge. So, you know, the ones who are able to access, maybe the ones who are in the cities, um, big cities and stuff like that, the rural areas are actually being left behind in terms of connectivity, access to infrastructure. And when I look at uh, the story of rural Africa, sometimes even electricity. So you need electricity to actually access internet. So if you don't have electricity, then, you know, uh, electricity is actually, you know, first priority. So access to infrastructure, um, electricity, uh, connectivity in terms of internet, and also the cost, the budget um, of this. So sometimes you'll find, yes, public schools, do they actually have the budget um, for internet? Is it a priority? You know, they have uh, other, you know, more pressing issues. But even in the private sector or private universities, private schools, do they actually have the budget for this? Because it, 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 it can be uh, costly as well to digitally transform. Another thing is access to devices. So 
even when you have the connectivity, do you have the devices? Are they uh, affordable devices, uh, whether you're using laptops, tablets, et cetera? So some nations have adopted the one laptop per child policy. And um, like Rwanda is really uh, taking that on and, and uh, succeeding in that. Um, but then we need to see a lot more affordable devices being rolled out in, in this. Um, we need to see a lot more partnerships to bring that about. Yeah, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Dr. Patrice, as we know, everything has their pros and cons. And what is the, what is the pros, pros and cons of digital education? Um, um, digital education has a big chance. And the big chance is we can bring education to the people living outside in the landscape, uh, not only in the developed countries, but also in Africa, for instance. Um, they, uh, people that are unable to move in cities, in big cities. Um, so the, the, there's the possibility that the countryside can develop and more people have access to education. With the help of smartphones and 3D printers, uh, companies can even be founded uh, in faraway districts. This is also a topic was in the Chinese uh, uh, digital Silk Road um, uh, plans um, that uh, Winston Marwins uh, published. So this is a true component and a very important component I think we should take into account. The cons are in already developed uh, educational contexts, uh, discipline is maybe hard to get from the children if they sit in front of a computer instead of a real life education. Mm. But everyone is learning uh, without uh, this kind of structure. This could be a bit of problem we saw in the in the Corona crisis here in Germany. The weaker ones have their their, their problems to follow the, the the lessons. This could be also a problem. The social and the social divide can grow in developed countries. This is definitely a topic we should take into account. Um, for the underdeveloped countries, uh, m the money for the equipment uh, is, um, as uh, Evelyn already um, pointed to, is a, is a problem, as well as the access to infrastructure and as well as electricity and the internet. These are the, um, the negative aspects, but uh, we are here to solve these problems. And I think we um, are on our way. We try with our project, the Agri Entrepreneurship Factory, um, to um, find a collaboration with a very big American um, foundation and we take every of these uh, aspects in our account to, to do that and to develop young African farmers with um, new technologies in the realm and also with sustainable concepts. This is, um, but this is uh, the next question then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael, I cannot agree more what you said in the previous question um, and, and actually your, your answer. Um, but what, uh, what have educations, organizations, we, we know uh, they're struggling, what they, they done well and what is still pending? Uh, what is, what is a very important that they, they start to doing, so to speak? Well, um, probably as, as, I, as I mentioned, what they're doing well is tackling all the infrastructure and technology issues. Uh, because they have the resources to do it, they have the environment to do it, they have the public support to do it. But what they are not doing so well is um, changing the, um, the paradigm of how you have to prepare people for, um, for digital transformation and for globalization. And in that set, we're talking spatially about mindsets and about different ways of working. I mean, we cannot work with new technology in the same way in which approach the previous technological issue. And in that sense, I think that there are two, two areas. One is the pedagogy that we are using. The pedagogy cannot be based anymore in someone who has a lot of knowledge, transmitting that knowledge to people who are listening that is a business model which is obsolete, okay? So we have to transform that into a different business model of teaching. That is one thing that is pending, okay? The second thing is that, and, and in, in that sense, there are two players, the students and the professors. Uh, I think that the students, especially in, in emerging countries, are hungry of of learning. 
and um, and in that sense, they are in a much better position to take advantage if they have the opportunity than the people who are working in emerging countries where they are used to a pedagogical system which is already obsolete. So I would say that you know progress in learning is different. It's, it's not linear anymore. It can be exponential. So anything that can be can get can be created in emerging country in in developed countries can be immediately um, uh, taken advantage by uh, learners in um, in emerging countries. I think that's a very good that's a very good trend. Now that that means that in any case, what teachers have to do is change their business model of teaching, and that is one of the most difficult issues a professor can face. You can change technology, you can change infrastructure. If the professor does not change his mindset, then we will not take full advantage of edtech transformation. In that sense, I think we still have a huge area of opportunity. And let me just mention some two or three things which I think is, is critical. Uh, to be able to change it. First, the concept of micro learning. Second, uh, the concept of taking advantage of um, the new way of learning of, of students today, which is visual learning. If we combine those things together, we can, we can, we can start to envision a completely new way of teaching uh, nowadays. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and um, <clears throat> Evelyn. Uh, Michael just mentioned the the opportunities. Um, of course, when it comes to digital transformation in education, what are the opportunities per 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 you? Yeah, I think one of the biggest opportunities that we see is in the area of connectivity, like I mentioned earlier. So, if connectivity is such a big challenge. Um, and I know that uh, UNICEF have the GIGA project where they're mapping schools, uh, you know, for the sake of connecting every school to the internet. So this project, um, you know, gives a lot of hope in terms of um, all the schools uh, having internet and then also brings the element of partnerships because I know the UN cannot do it alone. They need the telcos, they need the private sector, they need governments to come on board uh, in terms of this project. And even after mapping, who is going to provide the internet? You know, who's going to fund the project? At different aspects of this, so that's a huge opportunity for uh, for partnerships, for businesses uh, to partner to partner with the uh, development agencies, to partner with governments to bring this about because um, internet is becoming like a basic human need. You know, uh, we all need access to the internet, and it's not just about um, you know, the ones, you know, like all of us on this platform are probably able to afford that internet, but there are many who are not able to afford it. So how do we, and I think the fourth industrial revolution is about um, also connecting to the sustainable development goals such that no one is left behind. So if we say that, you know, we are advancing as the ones who are able to actually access internet, but that there's a whole demographic out there that's not able to access internet, then we're doing a disservice to ourselves as the world. So that's that's one of the opportunities is partnering um, the different partnerships to bring about internet and connectivity um, to those that don't have. Um, also in the area of affordable devices, like I talked about, um, funding is also another opportunity. And we've seen, you know, there's uh, the venture capital investments in in, in ed tech are quite low. Um, so just understanding why they're low, what can we do, what are, what are the business models that are not profitable, and how can we make them profitable. What are the technologies that we can use to be able to, to advance um, this agenda? So, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Beatrice. Um, what digital education should look like and how we can motivate them or let's let's use, use word, uh, how, how it can be enforced? Yeah, um, 
I heard I was uh, uh, taking part in several conferences. There was even one interesting one in Dubai where even the, the producers of the Hollywood films uh, will uh, propose to take part in the educational system. It means they could create films and um, devices that make uh, the, the motivation of the students more interesting. It's an interesting approach. But we uh, at the Kabbalah International University, which is a, a role, a role already existing online university since the 90s. Um, here the education is um, to integrate the students, to learn and exchange with the professors. It's very much individualized, this uh, education. Uh, every uh, student has to contribute to the lessons. Um, therefore, this um, approach of us with the PETSA foreign policy um, system and the educational approach of the agro-entrepreneurship hub uh, system, factory system, it's a lot of explanation nations now, I know. Um, there is this online university in the middle and the curriculum is arranged around the topics of policy, economy, technology and society. That means we have an applied science approach. Policy means we uh, con um, connect uh, to our, in, in the outside to uh, interact with governments, with NGO investors, financial support systems. In the inside, we teach how to to inform the, the public, to do the legislations, to do the incentives, the infrastructure and like this. In case of economy, we enclose companies, financial insurance systems, SDGs and financial instruments, for instance. Um, we um, give inter intent in in <laughs> we promote SDG factor oriented industries and fin in finance also as well as science cooperations. Um, for uh, technology, for economy, we enclose companies, financial insurance system, SDG financial instruments. For the technology, we promote technology developments, new developments in clean tech and agri-tech. Um, the societal factor is that we uh, secure, we teach the public to secure against misuse, to motivate the public, to educate them, to change the consciousness for structural change that passed away. And so we, we put it in the agriculture, uh, agri-entrepreneurship sector. So we we work, we, we, we connect um, the food and the agro research institutions, the governments and the political bodies and associations, the NGOs and so on. And in the inside, we do, as I already described, to uh, create the incentives, the uh, legislation the, and so on. Um, the economy, from the economy side, we... Uh, we count on diverse farming and agro programs considering the various aspects as uh, digital farming for instance as uh, crop production livestock production fishery and all these um, ingredients that are necessary for new concepts of farming in a sustainable um, realm and technology we uh, have a revolutionary approach to the highlight of the fourth industrial revolution, whatever it offers, um, this uh, already many uh, sustainable integrated farming, arrangement of age tech startups, vertical farming, circular economy with waste and water management, science corporations, as well as digital farming. Um, these are aspects we try to teach our students. The students are located in hubs around uh, with, um, we have contracts with universities and they have lands and they can put, um, uh, centers in place in, in real and they, they teach their students that are already um, on the way to become farmers and um, these hubs were created for the long lasting um, situation that means these farmers stays in place create the products and uh, they're taught how to sell them and how to connect uh, with the outside and get their own revenues and their own um, things. We have uh, four locations in the moment with uh, four universities. We have also a woman project that's very nice about uh, strawberries. They plant strawberries in Rwanda and um, for something like this. And we have a tech hub um, that is only connected to tech questions. And all this is connected and um, uh, and putting in the middle of this educational system of the agro-entrepreneurship factory done by Kavala International University, an American university um, consisting also of teachers that comes from these regions in the origin. They are um, they have their roots in these countries, and they are the, therefore very much of they have a very much of understanding of the local um, of the local um, needs. So this is my now a bit longer explanation, but I I, I gave you the place now for the next question. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Uh, we have some uh, um, very nice comments, uh, very insightful comments from Juan Jose de la, de la Mora. Uh, I encourage our uh, panelists to uh, engage if they can, and more, more comments are coming. Thank you so much for engaging. Okay, let's uh, move to uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, why is, is it so difficult for ad sector to change in a faster and more profound way? I think you already have some touch points, but can you elaborate a little bit further, please? Well, uh, as I mentioned, it is a very regulated sector. Uh, education is a long-term uh, process. You don't find very quick results. That's why um, politicians uh, not really don't, don't give the importance they should in these areas, but getting more into the core of the problem, I think that um, innovation is something that education needs. And innovation, uh, you can mention education, uh, innovation in several aspects. The first aspect is uh, the, 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 the role of technology. You know, students need to prepare for, for their future jobs and they need to learn technology, not as something which is static, but something which will help them to uh, tackle problems in different ways. So that, that view of technology is completely different than the academic view of technology. The academic view of technology is I'm going to show you a technology so you can apply it. The modern view of technology is there is a huge array of technology that can be in order to create new solutions. One innovative aspect which is lacking in the educational system. The second is that is the focus on the needs of the consumers or of the clients. I mean, the educational sector is too much centered on the student instead of centered in the problems that the students have to solve. So I think that putting a very uh, um, strong uh, focus on what they are going to help to solve in society, in their own lives, etc is critical. And the third thing is, you know, all this process in, in academy, and, and I'm in it, I mean, I, I'm a PhD, I'm a professor, I'm a lecturer, it's, it's so much ingrained into a 200 uh, old century concept, which is the grades. I mean, I go to university to, to get a grade, a master's degree grade, a graduation grade that is radically or has to radically change. And there is a, a trend now to the concept of certification. I love the concept of certification. It is very practical. It is focused in a space in, in a spatial need. It is short term and it uses all these concepts we've, we've, we've mentioned. I mean, practical problems, technology that helps you to to, to solve them and focus on the problem. So as an example, uh, typically, if you want to be a logistical expert, you would get into a specialized program or a master's program. Today, Amazon is right now um, uh, giving certifications for logistic issues that take six months and are much better practical, et cetera, than what universities are doing. I think that the future of education in this sense is by certifications, not by master's degrees and, and this type of very rigid, very expensive, very long-term uh, educational outcomes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, Evelyn, what's the skills required for digital transformation to gain traction in education? Yeah, I think... Um... One of the key skills, obviously, is the technological skills. So we've got to understand, you know, what that, what are the technologies um, of the fourth industrial revolution, um, etc. Some people may want to actually be uh, go in depth into the uh, technological skills, and I think Michael has talked about that in terms of doing short courses and and, and certifications on on technological skills. But one area sometimes um, that we haven't focused on a lot are the strategic skills. Um, especially for teachers, um, for admin, for leadership, 
um, and also for learners as well. So when you look at um, the difference between the strategic and the, and, the, and the technical skills and what we offer at our academia strategic skills is the strategic skills give you sort of a high level big picture view. So if you were in, a, in, in the event that you don't want to be a, you know, an expert in a such, say for example, you don't want to be an expert in or a data analyst, you know, you just want to understand how data is being used, um, how the different industries, maybe education, maybe um, retail, et cetera, using big data and analytics, um, then you need a high level understanding kind of strategic view of, or, or a big picture view of how the emerging technologies are being used and how, what are the use cases across, across different industries. So it's more high level as opposed to going in depth into the technical, uh, the technical aspects of the different technologies. So that's very key for us, not just for, uh, for learners, but also for upskilling the teachers, upskilling um, the leadership uh, in different schools, universities, et cetera. And, and also changing the curriculum to include that aspect of strategic skills. But another aspect, you know, another set of skills that we really need are 21st century skills. So it's not just enough for us to understand the technology aspects or the emerging technologies. We've got to um, uh, look at how do we um, incorporate these 21st century skills, problem solving, creativity, entrepreneurship, um, and emotional intelligence is quite a big one as well. And one of the areas that are found, um, one of the initiatives, interesting initiatives that are found is the inner development goals. So we have, we know uh, about the sustainable development goals, but um, the IDGs or the inner development goals are looking at how, you know, why hasn't the progress, you know, we're looking at the SDGs, meeting the SDGs by 2030, but the progress has been slow. So why is it slow? It means there has to be inner change for us to actually have outer change in the environment, in, in, in our surroundings. So it's got to come from inner change. How do you understand yourself? Um, do you understand yourself, emotional intelligence, such that the inner change now will drive the outer change in terms of us meeting the SDGs? So that's one key concept that I found. It's still at inception, but it's something that is, um, I'm hopeful will gain traction because once you understand yourself as an individual, you understand your skills, you understand your strengths, your weaknesses, you're able to be more anchored or more rooted in yourself and hence um, be more grounded. So we're seeing a lot of children now, even with the digital transformation, experiencing mental health challenges. So that's one of the issues that yeah, you know, will be reduced in terms of mental health challenges because um, mental health issues, again, well, there are different reasons, but one of the things, emotional intelligence actually helps us to cope with mental health uh, challenges or in, you know, threats. Let me talk about mental health threats. So I think that's that's um, some of the skills that we really need. Yes, we need the technical skills, but we also need strategic skills and the 21st century skills uh, with a focus on um, emotional intelligence. But then also, you know, creativity and all the other 21st century skills. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, uh, we love to to share knowledge, but also examples. So, um, Dr. Beatrice, if you can share. Um, uh, how does your model, uh, PETS, uh, uh, foreign uh, policy uh, ecosystem ed educational approach look like? Yeah, I already uh, pointed at it, uh, it in my last answer. It is uh, uh, the, the online, the American Online Kabbalah International University is in the middle, and we teach uh, and educate uh, farmers, young farmers in Africa, how to use the new technologies, how to use the sustainable concepts and how um, to, we have an integrated approach that's consisting of policy, economy, technology and society. I already mentioned it. Uh, the political side is uh, outside is to, to do the connections to other um, governments, um, NGOs and so on. The inside connection is uh, that we create, that they know about the legislation, about the infrastructure and these things the economy is to um, we include not only the teaching um, system we include also com companies in reality and financial um, and insurance systems so as well with SDGs and uh, system uh, correct uh, financial uh, instruments uh, we uh, 
teach about the new technologies, clean tech, um, agri tech, um, and we integrate society and motivate uh, the people secure against mis uh, misuse and um, create this consciousness for this structural change. And we uh, have this applied science approach in, in that, that we create hubs around the systems in different uh, African countries like Uganda, Rwanda, and Nigeria and other parts, um, mostly connected with universities in place. And um, they acquire lands or have lands uh, where these students and farmers can practice what we teach them and um, establish uh, their businesses. They really establish their business in place. And um, so it is a solution that is created for the long run and sustainable in itself again. And so this is just their revenues again flow in the system. And so the system is, is, is um, sustainable in itself. So this is the thing we are working on and um, we have a lot of students already and we have we, we are working to have the support of a very important American foundation and yeah this is the plan <laughs> and this will be done also. Hello? I think we've lost Ned. Please? Hello? Yeah, he's, he's lost. Okay, this is the system and um, we use it for the agriculture sector. It's already existing in other sectors, um, but we use it as an educational model in the sector. I okay. think, I don't know what's the next question um, is. Uh, we have to list. Maybe you can jump in. That's Malte again, isn't it? I'm, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, okay. <laughs> Unmute myself. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so looking at the time, we have um, uh, more or less than four minutes. Uh, so, uh, Michael, starting with you, uh, what is your final message to our audience in regards to the topic? Uh, one minute, please. Well, uh, thank you. Um, basically, I think that uh, digital transformation gives us a huge opportunity to learn better, to learn faster, uh, to uh, give access to education to all the population in the world now. This is not a technological issue only. Of course, we have the devices, we have the infrastructure, but that's just the first step. The second step is to allow uh, the students and the professors to be able to change their mind shift, to take advantage of these technologies. And the third level, which is very important, which is change. All of this is a change process. And we are not prepared to such a level and the pace of change as we are having. So we have to bet on emotional skills related to change. That means we have to start teaching from schools up to universities and business schools about resilience, about empathy, about you know, uh, all these emotional skills without which we will be unable to take advantage of all of these technological opportunities we have. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Your one minute final message. Yeah, um, I think for me is to see the success of you know education 4.0 or digital transformation in education really lies in our ability as you know a global uh, village um, lies in our ability to bridge the digital divide. So we've got to look at um, how are we giving back to society? So the ones who are able or who have an advantage, how then um, can we actually help the less or the disadvantaged communities, the dis disadvantaged environments, such that you know, we're all moving and no one is left behind uh, in this era. And you know, I couldn't agree more with what Michael has said we've got to look at inner change, inner change, emotional intelligence, understanding ourselves, self-awareness, empathy, all those softer skills are the ones that um, create an environment for us to innovate, experiment, and actually um, take us to where we need to be. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Beatrice, your final statement? <laughs> Uh, I would say in, uh, it's best it will create a fresh young elite of entrepreneurs busy not only in their countries but connected all over the world. Women can be empowered in a big part of it. Unemployment will be reduced far away districts developed. You 
can give them and you should give them with this positive uh, view on these possibilities. The image and the vision, anything goes. Everybody can do his business. Everyone can, can learn his business and give them the kick. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I have enough time just to to share these uh, um, uh, our thanks to all our panelists today. So, um, in um, uh, name of European Technology Chamber, I would like to thank Evelyn Negatia, and uh, we will plant the tree uh, as our uh, EU Tech Partnership with um, uh, Climate Action, and also for uh, Michael. Thank you, Michael, so much for your contribution, uh, for you, same as well, and also for Dr. Beatrice. Uh, these certificates will be sent to you um, uh, right after this webinar. Thank you so much, and of course, thank to our audience for, um, for being here um, uh, and uh, for, for listening very, very nice insights from our panelists. Uh, in the name of Technology Chamber, European Technology Chamber, I would like to thank you again and see you on our next event on 15 of the September next month. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 You are currently the only person in this conference.